Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be doing a quick rundown of various types of chemical reactions. So it turns out there's going to be a lot of ways you can categorize chemical reactions. We're just going to cover a couple of the major ones. So one of the first big ways we can talk about chemical reactions is by looking at what happens to our reactants and products. And this is actually kind of a cool and fairly general approach. So the first major idea is we can have synthesis. So everybody loves synthesis because what I do is I take two simple things and I make one more complex thing. Sometimes this is actually fairly useful. So for example, in synthesis, it can be simply, uh, simple as uh, when I add CO2 to water, I can make something called carbonic acid. Now, most of you are probably familiar with carbonic acid because it's part of what gives carbonated water its bite. So even if you're not adding, uh, going the full way of adding soda, if I'm just putting, C uh, putting CO2 into water, say making sparkly water, it has a little bit more tanginess than normal water. And what you're tasting is the acid of carbonic acid, uh, which ends up being produced simply by mixing CO2 and water. We also have decomposition. Now here's an important feature, is if I can have a synthesis going one way, I can always have the reverse reaction uh, as well. So the reverse of a synthesis reaction will be a decomposition reaction. However, it is worth noting, some reactions, both directions go fairly evenly. Some reactions, really only one of the uh, paired reactions takes place. And we'll be talking about this uh, much later in the semester, and it will be a big focus of the second semester of this course. So turns out when I put, if I just put carbonic acid in water, it often will decompose to make CO2, which is one of the reasons why as soon as you open a can of soda or a bottle of carbonated water, it has that fizz, as all of that carbonic acid I've trapped ends up being released. We also have something called a single displacement reaction. So this is kind of uh, uh, this is kind of like a object coming in fast, hitting a molecule, and bouncing off something else. So molecule uh, A comes out, kicks out component B. And a good example of this would be something like calcium fluoride mixed with uh, liquid bromine. So what ends up happening is the bromine displaces the fluoride, and we end up with calcium, brom uh, calcium bromide and fluorine gas. And there's any number of forms of reactions uh, like this. Many of them include having something attached to the metal, uh, to a metal, which I can replace. Now, this is related to the much more common double displacement. And we'll be talking about a fair number of double displacement reactions throughout this course. The classic one is I have two salts, which can end up reacting, producing a net species. In this case, silver nitrate and uh, potassium chromate, making a solid uh, silver chromate and potassium nitrate. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who are interested, this is actually one of the early forms of uh, of photography, where you'd cover a plate with silver nitrate and potassium chromate. It would react in light to produce silver chromate. And interestingly enough, it produces potassium nitrate, more commonly known as saltpeter, an important component of gunpowder. However, this actually is a well-known reaction called a precipitation reaction. And this is another way we can categorize reactions by looking at general themes. So precipitation reactions are typically reactions that produce solids from salts. We also have acid-base reactions, which we've talked about a little bit before, and gas evolution reactions. It is worth noting, the way it uh, does exactly what's on the tin, it's a, any reaction that produces gas. And it is worth noting that these reactions can overlap there will be some precipitation reactions that also produce gas. And we've already seen at least one acid-base reaction that produces gas. I'm looking at you baking, so baking soda and gas, and, and uh, acid produces CO2. So again, these are not mutually exclusive procedures. 
We also have oxidation reduction reactions, uh, which are reactions in which electrons move. One big uh, subcategory is combustion reactions, because who doesn't watch uh, watching love, thing, love to watch things burn? So let's go ahead and look at each of these in, uh, individually. So precipitation reactions involve the production of a solid. So again, this does include things like the silver nitrate potassium chromate reaction. But it also includes things like you can, act, uh, you can mix uh, lead nitrate and potassium iodide to produce lead iodide and potassium nitrate. Now, this is actually a really uh, cool reaction because you can add potassium iodide crystals to water and it will remove most of the lead present in the water as solid. And this is one of the emergency procedures that was used to help clean up the Flint water crisis of adding various salts to remove lead solid. And you'll notice that with these precipitation reactions where I'm producing solid, uh, that they often have uh, the general form of a double displacement, where I'm replacing lead with potassium and <clears throat> iodide with nitrate. And we'll see this again with the silver nitrate reaction. We also have acid-base reactions. So more or less, acid-base reactions are usually some form of displacement reaction, either single or double, where we're looking at the exchange of a proton. So for a good example of a set of double displacement reactions, we have a classic one of uh, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. You mix these together, uh, very, uh, two very corrosive chemical species, and I get table salt and water. I produce salt water. And this is actually a cool type of reaction, which is called neutralization. I react an acid and a base together, and you'll often produce some form of salt, which may or may not be an acid or base itself. Another variant of this is uh, you can mix sulfuric acid with ammonia. When you do this, you produce something called ammonium sulfate, which as I brought up previously, is a fairly common form of fertilizer. We also have classic gas production reactions, which again, does what it says on the tin. And we've already seen this with combining an acid and carbonate or baking soda to produce a salt, water, and this time we get CO2 for free. But we also have other forms of reactions, such as I can mix HCl and zinc solid. And when you do this, what ends up happening is the zinc, uh, uh, the zinc bonds to the chlorine and leaves behind hydrogen gas. So this is actually one of the cheaper ways you can make hydrogen gas. However, zinc doesn't exactly grow on trees. Now, the last big overarching theme of react, uh, overarching reaction theme is redox reaction. It is one of the most prevalent type of reactions. And at the end of next semester, we'll have a whole chapter devoted to these. They are that important. So the basic idea of a redox reaction is they involve a change of oxidation numbers of at least two elements, which is a technical way of just saying, we're moving electrons from one atom to another. And let's go ahead and see what this looks like. So let's go ahead and say, I want to combine zinc with rust, iron oxide. Well, it turns out that this can produce zinc oxide, which you may know is a component of some uh, sunscreens and good old solid iron. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the oxidation states. In this case, zinc and iron are both metals. And the iron in iron oxide is going to be iron three plus. We've seen this one before. And since oxygen is minus two, zinc has to be plus two to keep the species overall neutral. <clears throat> so what ends up uh, happening is that we've moved electrons from the zinc to the iron because the iron starts with a deficit of electrons and it ends up with the right amount. Zinc starts off with the right amount and ends up with too few. So electrons moved from zinc to iron. And it turns out that while this reaction is tricky to do as it needs to have the right conditions, it's one way you can try and salvage rusty objects.
A more traditional way of trying to think about oxidation reactions is you can take an object like iron and expose it to the world's best oxidant, oxygen. Most elements, when you combine with oxygen, will end up undergoing, again, a change in oxidation state here, going from neutral to plus three, meaning we lost, uh, iron lost three electrons, meaning that oxygen gained some, to produce rust. <clears throat> now, this also brings us to the beginning of one of the most important classes of reactions which is combustion reactions, because who doesn't love combustion? So we're used to thinking about combustion in terms of, say, fuels that produce lots of heat, but combustion reactions can actually apply to any sort of reaction with molecular oxygen. So whether that's iron or methane, as we've seen before. So we can have methane, uh, reacting with oxygen to produce CO2 and water. And it's worth noting that any simple hydrocarbon, so anything that's just carbon and hydrogen, will follow a very similar reaction, uh, a reaction mechanism. Where again, how we balance the reaction is this idea that carbon has to be the same on both sides. So if I start with X, molecule, uh, X atoms of carbon, I have to end with X molecules of CO2. And with uh, water, if I start with Y uh, atoms of hydrogen, I have to end with half that many molecules of water because, again, all the hydrogen have to pair up. And then the trick is then just figuring out how many oxygen atoms it takes to drive this reaction forward, which can often be given uh, by taking X and then Y number of, <clears throat> of hydrogen in order to figure out how to drive the reaction forward. <clears throat> and so this can be really useful as all of the mass of CO2 or of carbon becomes CO2. And then you can, uh, the hydrogen all turns into H2O and then just using basic balancing to figure it out. And then from here, we can use uh, also all of our stoichiomet stoichiometric tricks to figure out how much of a hydrocarbon will produce how much CO2, which has been very important in environmental modeling. However, it's very important to realize that it turns out that hydrogen and carbon aren't the only things that are present in objects that burn. So a lot of organic compounds include a lot of the other elements, especially our schnapps elements. The two, two of the more common ones that can be quite problematic are sulfur and nitrogen. They're common, but they occur in a lot of organic molecules. Now, one of the reasons why this is problematic is sulfur turns into SO2 and uh, nitrogen becomes various nitrogen oxides. Uh, more commonly, these are often known as SOX, S-O-X, and NOX, N-O-X. So SOX and NOx are some of the more potent pollutants uh, that are produced by the fossil fuel industry because they can produce acid rain as well as eat through the ozone layer. And often, because that isn't enough, can be a potent greenhouse, greenhouse gas. And again, it's one of the reasons we want to try and move away from these, ele uh, from these elements. Uh, in addition, um, many uh, ores contain metal ions, which will often re, uh, leave behind a solid metal oxide residue, such as iron oxide or rust. Now, in addition to being unfortunate uh, components, they can actually help us do elemental analysis and figuring out the empirical formula of a, of a molecule, as we saw last chapter. Because if I know exactly how much CO2, water, SO2, NO2, or metal oxide I produce, I can figure out how much each of these elements were present in my original sample. And we can do this for any number of organic molecules, like a good old, uh, a good old very cool molecule of, uh, of cysteine. So cysteine is a sulfur-containing amino acid, and it's the reason why when you burn hair, it smells 
Well, like rotten eggs, because you're releasing sulfur. So these can produce quite complex chemical reactions because again, carbon all becomes CO2, hydrogen all becomes water, nitrogen becomes nitrate, <coughs> and uh, sulfur becomes sulfur dioxide. Uh, and one of the things we can do is by determining the molar ratios of all of these different product species, we can figure out full empirical formulas. So if I know how much of the CO2 I produce, I can help figure out how much uh, carbon is present in this species. Now, one of the problems is always figuring out whether my original molecule contained oxygen. And one of the ways you can do, uh, do this is uh, go ahead and uh, you first have to figure out the mass of oxygen that you actually burned. Because if I know the mass of oxygen that I burned, and I know the total masses of all of these species, I can figure out what mass of oxygen had to come from my original molecule, which can be quite tricky, but is a really useful way and was classically the original way you'd figure out the identity of a chemical species. So next time, we're going to be looking a little bit more at individual chemical reactions and trying to figure out how, how we can use these um, chemical equations to figure out exactly how much product I can produce. Until then, take care.